All right, we're back. Bill 2014, day three. I hope you enjoyed that wonderful talk by Dustin and Mads. They'll be on Channel 9 Live later today. But first, .NET Native. Um, really nice to have Sean Farkas, lead developer. Um, you're going to have to pronounce your last name because I'm going to mess it up. That's fine. Uh, it's Hey Darian. It's a combination nice. of Hey and Darian. That's like, how hey, Darian. Hey, Darian. hey Darian. Hey Darian. What's going on? How are you yeah, doing, exactly. man? <laughs> right on. Good. So you got. So you're sort of the leader of the sort of .NET stuff that's going on these days. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it the leader, but uh, I'm essentially uh, run the program management team on the .NET team, which includes essentially the .NET runtime, the .NET framework, and things like setup and servicing. Right on. And you're a, you're a, you're a dev. I'm a dev. Right on, man. And you did a lot of work. You and your team for .NET Native, which is IL compiled to highly optimized machine code. Absolutely. And the JIT steps removed at runtime, there's no JITting. Right. Um, and this adds immediate impact on the speed at which an application will load. Yep. And you guys are putting less in memory. So tell us memory. a little bit about .NET Native, just an overview of people out there who haven't been reading blogs. So the high level is you take a C-sharp managed application, uh, you put it through our tool chain, goes to the C-sharp compiler as normal, comes out as IL. Then our tool chain takes its input, that IL, along with any third-party libraries you have and a refactored framework that we're providing. It processes all of that, throws away the pieces you don't need, and puts it into the C++ compiler's back end. C++ compiler then produces native code for ARM or x64 that'll then run directly on the device without needing to load up the, the traditional .NET framework or, you know, JIT compiler, as you were saying. We're also running against a refactored CLR, so it's actually down to about 200 kilobytes, and it's effectively <laughs> just a garbage collector. Amazing, yep. amazing. And what about the BCL part of it? Uh, Obviously, you don't have the whole BCL. Yeah, I mean, as basically uh, Sean mentioned, if you look at what, uh, with .NET development today, you basically have the .NET framework that you, you redistribute with your application or it's already on the machine. Okay. Uh, with .NET Native, uh, the idea is uh, we have this thing called essentially dependency reducer where it goes through and then removes all the unused dependencies and you're literally just left with the things that the application needs and nothing else. Mm -hmm. And as Sean mentioned, that stuff's now linked in so there isn't a, a separate BCL or sort of base class libraries. That Amazing, call man. Into. In fact, in yesterday's demos, the, the uh, thing that we showed was if you look at um, IL development today in the debugger, you basically see the assembly name and the load path. Uh, with .NET Native, what you see is the assembly name, but it actually says something to the effect of, you know, uh, module has been embedded, right? So we we'll tell you that it's there, but it's, it's physically actually inside the exe now. It is, mm -hmm. yep. and then you have, but, but most of the stuff is inside of the DLL, and then you have the right. lightweight XE above it, right? Yeah, that yeah. calls the, it and loads it into itself. The XE is nothing more than an entry point that just, the, the DLL effectively <laughs> exports a function called main, and the XE says, go call that thing. Totally, sort of like I explore.exe, remember that? <laughs> yeah. Light loads all this <laughs> stuff in. So, I never thought I would hear like .NET and linker in the same <laughs> sentence. This mm -hmm. is wonderful. Um, the question I would have is, if I'm using a third party library, right. A lot of third-party libraries use things like reflection, yep. which require jitting, right? Or well, some amount so, of runtime. So, so reflection jitting. invocation it is interesting because it doesn't necessarily involve jitting, but um, if we're doing dependency reduction, as Habib was talking about, we might throw away the pieces that the reflection needs to get at if we don't know that statically you're going to get to them. Uh, the dependency reducer actually has some built-in smarts and heuristics to try to figure out what kind of reflection you're doing. Mm. Um, we found that, as you pointed out, third-party libraries tend to uh, reflect back on applications, and you have this interesting problem where uh, the library knows what kind of reflection it's going to use, but not on what types. And the application doesn't know what reflection the library is going to use, because that sort of breaks the abstraction boundary. Uh, so what we've done is we've provided this uh, XML language where a library can describe how it's going to use reflection. So for instance, if you have a serialized method, it could be serialized of T, you know, serialized as an object. Uh, the library can describe any type T which is passed to this function, make sure it sticks around to be reflectable later. Awesome. So as always, we do Channel 9 Live for you. Ask questions, where's Felix? Where's people on the thread? I expect you guys to be here asking questions. Um, so the one thing I would ask is, you must mention a customized CLR. Right? And yep. a customized base class library that's been highly optimized. Yep. That's in the preview. Yep. And it's also today Windows Store apps only, which right. of course makes perfect sense. You're running on an ARM device. Yep. I don't want load. I don't want a lot of memory consumption. I want my code to run. You don't want to be generating code on your ARM device. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. You don't want to be jitting, right. period. Right. Yep. So um, what's sort of the thinking about the fact that you have 
a bunch of other .NET code out there, right. like on the desktop, and the desktop is important to us. Mm -hmm. um, I could see you know, a really nice experience for a line of business apps written for WPF, for example, mm -hmm. uh, where this would come in very handy, and that's a hard problem. So, but are you guys, you're working on this, or are you gonna go take a vacation after build? <laughs> I wish. Uh, <laughs> the way I would uh, describe the, uh, the problem, Charles, is, Really, if you look at .NET Native, it's an evolution of the cloud compiler technology that we introduced with Windows Phone 8, right? Okay. And so the idea behind uh, that was that we wanted to use automatic pre-compilation to make um, phone applications that much faster. But it was a hybrid model, meaning we did most of the pre-compilation in the cloud, and then there was a final binding step on the device itself. Uh, and so with .NET Native, we took the same set of principles and ideas and now went all the way in where all the compilation happens in the cloud and there's no compilation on the device itself. So that is our point of entry uh, at this point, meaning the, uh, the fact that we support store uh, to begin with, it's an explicit choice that we made because we really want to prove out the technology to make sure that it works. Of course. And the reason why I said that, Charles, is there are literally hundreds of thousands of .NET apps out there, and the workloads are, they just run the entire gamut of <laughs> what people want to do. And at, at the beginning, .NET Native lends itself really well to store applications, but there is kind of nothing stopping us from exploring additional scenarios. So as we speak right now, we're trying to look at, you know, how can we take the, set of, the same set of technologies and principles and apply them to additional uh, scenarios and technologies. Excellent. So we have our first question from Andre Abrantes. How do you know which JIT compiler was used on my compiled assemblies? Checking in VST bug for protojit.dll? Let me make sure. <laughs> so, uh, the protojit.dll, I think the, the gentleman or uh, person on the uh, question is, is that is related to the, our new next generation uh, JIT compiler, which is uh, RyuJIT, yes. your name? Uh, and uh, I, I think, yeah, you, you should be able to basically look at the uh, that DLL protege, uh, that, that DLL that's been loaded into your process to see whether that is the one that's loaded into your process. And that's that's the next gen uh, JIT compiler. Right on. Yes. So just look for the, the right DLL, yeah. man. But I just want to make sure that that question was related to our JIT compiler as opposed to .NET Native, which are two separate things. Of course, because in .NET Native, your JIT, you better not have a JIT right. running in exactly. process. Exactly. Otherwise, it's it, not. I mean, right, and, and well, but I, we do want to sort of make a distinction here that, that the developer preview we released a couple of days ago, that's definitely true. Everything is statically compiled. You can certainly imagine down the line that there are some scenarios where most things, what well, you want to be statically compiled, but you do want the freedom to maybe bring in a JIT compiler for a few scenarios. And uh, we're not saying that .NET Native will never allow JIT compilation. Uh, at this stage, it doesn't, but as you know, we get apps that, that maybe benefit from having a JIT pull in later, uh, that's something we might look at. That's actually an interesting, that's, you know, to me, that sort of hybrid model, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. Because you get the initial load speed up, because the JIT's not going to do a whole program compilation to optimize. Right. Yep. But you might want to go in and mess around with method bodies or something, or insert some code. Yeah, or... If you have something that's heavily reflection-based, a lot of times we find that dynamic methods are used effectively as a perf optimization for what would have just been reflection. Right? And uh, that might be something that you know, we have to look at maybe, maybe supporting in the future. Uh, cool. Felix, welcome aboard, man. Hey, Felix. So .NET Native uses another code base for BCL. Yep. Sounds like a, main, a maintenance problem. Will it be unified? So let me uh, just give a little bit of background as to why that is. Uh, we, we talked about that we have a dependency reducer that goes through your program and figures out which pieces you need, which pieces you don't need, throws out the parts you don't need. Uh, the existing .NET framework code base is built up over you know, 10 plus years. Uh, was built up with assumptions that everything below is going to be there at all times. Uh, so as a, as a result, it's really uh, very quite tangled. Right? And it's actually kind of difficult to pull apart pieces that you don't need because of the assumptions of the layering of, of, of the system at the time. Uh, we found for the dependency reducer problem, we want to be able to, to really cleanly separate pieces out that you don't need. And one of the easiest ways to do that was just to start with a clean refactoring of the framework. Uh, it is a, if you look at the .NET uh, core profile, we basically start with that and try to implement that in a cleanly, nicely factored way. Yeah, uh, the team doesn't want to support two separate code bases either, right? So, <laughs> of, of course, over time, we would like to have the clean, refactored code base be the one that we're, we're moving forward on. Uh, but it, this wasn't just a, let's just write a new BCL thing. We actually had some pretty good tech, tech reasons that we need to do that. And, I mean, that's always been something that you guys have been 
working on year over year over year is sort of modularizing, componentizing, sort of in your refactoring of a very large library yep. to enable scenarios one day where you can do things like this right. and be able to, you know, by you know, having modulars, if you will, right. uh, makes it a lot easier. Yep. And so, yeah, nobody wants two code bases. This is a preview technology. Right, absolutely. absolutely. And the other thing I'd like to add, Charles, is if you look at what's happening with our library strategy, uh, NuGet is becoming the place where we're starting to release new functionality. So uh, in the future, hopefully, when it comes to APIs, they will be uh, somewhat independent of the work that we do in things like that, that native. So it doesn't matter if you're running a, in a JIT environment or a non-JIT environment, you'll be able sure. to use the same sort of capabilities going forward. At some point, at some time, right. it won't be called .NET native anymore. It'll be it called just .NET. 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 Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So Carlos, uh, why C Sharp native is faster than C Sharp CLR bytecode? Um, okay, JIT compiler must generate code for super scalar processors, and CLR is a stack machine. So the code generator that we're using in .NET native is actually the C++ compiler's back end. So all the great optimizations you get for your visual C++ code are getting applied to .NET native code. Uh, in Habib's future of .NET talk yesterday, for example, he, he showed off a little bit of auto vectorization, which isn't nice. in, the, in the preview that we have out now, but it's coming soon. Um, that, that's an example of a kind of optimization that the C++ backend gets us that we don't have from a JIT compiler. And part of that is just, uh, we get to spend a lot more processing power applying optimizations if you're doing it in a build lab than if you're doing it on a device. You know, if you're calling a method for the first time in your application on the UI thread, you're going to be a little agitated if we spend a lot of time trying to figure out which loops might be able to be you know, auto-vectorized. Mm. But if you're on a build machine, that's what those cycles are for. Right? Excellent. So Osin wants to know, <clears throat> excuse me, how does this ahead of time technology compare to Mono Xamarin's AOT? Does it handle things that generate dynamic code like link, for example? So we do, we do support Link. Uh, we support Link in sort of an interesting way. Uh, if you look at what's happening under the covers, Link builds expression trees. We have an expression tree interpreter built in. And it actually just walks the expression tree and sort of executes what it would have done, whereas the uh, desktop CLR would you know, generate a dynamic method and JIT it. And at first off, you say, well, wait a minute. That sounds like I'm suffering perf here, and this was a perf play. Uh, we did some measurements initially when we came up with this, and it turns out that for some really large number of executions, the interpreter actually wins over the JIT just because of the uh, cost you pay upfront for the JIT. And we're talking somewhere in you know, 70 some odd executions of a link expression. It's actually faster for us to interpret wow. it than it is for us to JIT it upfront. Interesting. Yep. Excellent. Great question. Stilgar wants to know can you dynamically load assemblies with .NET Native? So .NET Native works uh, by, as we say, it statically looks at the full closure of your program. And uh, it pulls in all the code that might be executed into the final uh, binary that we're producing. Uh, so there's not uh, necessarily a concept of assembly load pulling in some, some code off a of disk. Mm -hmm. uh, now assembly load, of course, exists in the uh, profile for, uh, for, for uh, Windows Core that, that you can use in Windows Store. Mm -hmm. um, and if you call that, you're effectively going down a reflection route, which then kicks into the, uh, the story we were talking about earlier, where the dependency producer sort of applies some heuristics, and we have mm -hmm. some XML that you can talk about how you're using reflection. So at the high level, assembly load will work the same way it does. Um, and, and that's actually an important thing to think about is .NET Native is an optimization step applied at the end of your program. It's not something that's going to make it behave differently. Uh, and, and so if something works in your C Sharp version of your Windows Store app, it will work equally well in .NET Native. You know, barring some bugs and some features not yet implemented, it's an early preview. Mm. Uh, so of course, you can call assembly load in your C Sharp Windows Store app. You can call it on .NET Native. The only difference is you're not going to see, at this point, another assembly loading up. You're actually just going to be referencing code that happens to already be in the DLL that, that we built. Certainly. Cool. Um, Kevin wants to know, you can use vector math that is hardware accelerated now? <laughs> That's a really interesting point, Kevin. <laughs> Kevin is our JIT dev lead, who just del delivered Ryu JIT. <laughs> nice job, man. Hi, Kevin. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Uh, I, I, honestly, uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know the answer. Uh, Kevin, whether that's a question or a statement? <laughs> if you can clarify, Kevin, are you, are you making a statement? Or, or I think Kevin's question? trying to get us to say that we have SIMD preview on the Ryu JIT. Uh, okay, <laughs> uh, nice. yes. CGP that just came out, and uh, uh, with the, or the uh, the vector math library that you download from right. Google. Yeah, cool. I mean, the whole point of this native thing is that you take advantage of modern hardware. So if you look at what the VC Plus backend guys are doing today with the introduction of things like Haswell, that adds a lot of complexity to their lives, yep. right? Because there's new things that the, that, and new ways that the processor is going to manage things. Yep. And you have to adjust yep. at the backend compiler level. Yep. Mm -hmm. So by unifying the backend, 
we're going to be able to get the .NET people, the, the C Sharp people, the BB.NET people, all of the benefits of modern hardware, mm -hmm. um, which of course is SIMD, vectorization, auto parallelization, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it's, right. the future is very bright yep. here. Yep. And, and what Kevin was actually pointing out is even without .NET native, uh, the Ryuji compiler is now capable of using these SIMD instructions on uh, the, these sorts of processors. Uh, but I mean, does GTP. that add, the, what I would ask Kevin back would be, if you're going to be doing that level of, of analysis or, or computation, you're going to add more time. So does it take more time to auto-vectorize at runtime? So the Ryuji actually doesn't do auto-vectorization. Uh, what, what you do is you download this, uh, this library from NuGet, and it's got vector types in it, and you okay. code against those vector types, and then the RyuJit understands that and, and, and is able to emit SIMD instructions. I was going to say, I mean, that, that, so good, good. So how is .NET Native different from the tool engine, which is actually a question I've seen pop up all over the place. Sure. Uh, so .NET Native is just sort of an evolution of Engine. Right? Engine existed from the first day of the .NET framework. It's how you uh, generated native code for the assembly that it, as it was on disk. Uh, and then we moved through uh, to Windows Phone 8 where we did a little bit of compilation in the cloud and then as we were saying earlier, .NET Native kind of goes all the way. Mm -hmm. uh, Engine has some different characteristics from .NET Native in that uh, it contains both the IL and the Engine image and it actually has dependencies on other Engine images. So uh, for instance, if we take a security patch to MS Corelib, that invalidates MS Corelib's Engine image, but it also invalidates every other Engine image on the machine because it transitively has a closure back down onto MS Corelib. With .NET Native, We've compiled all your dependencies together, so a patch to one binary, perhaps in some other application, doesn't have any effect at all on yours. Right? We're not going to throw it away and fall back to the JIT. Excellent. And that was sort of the notion of the fragility of NGEN yes. that we discussed mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, right. actually. And that was when the MDIL sort of movements started happening, what you guys are doing with the phone. So this is a great evolution of what you guys have started a few years ago. Um, will .NET native support auto P optimizations? So auto parallelization. We already sort of talked about that stuff that the back end C++ compiler already does today. You know. It's not in the current preview, but it is coming. Right on. Yep. Um, Vic wants to know, any way to dump the GC if I want, want to get truly deterministic memory management? So the .NET native pitch, right, is it's, it's productivity of C Sharp, performance of C++. Right? Part of the great benefit in the productivity of C Sharp is that you get a garbage collector. You don't have to think about the memory management. Um, as I was saying earlier, it's, it's really an optimization step at the end. It's not something that we want to change the programming model that you're used to. Mm. So uh, now, GC is a fundamental part of the .NET programming model, and it, it's a fundamental part of .NET Native as well. Thus the name .NET Native mm -hmm. versus something like, say, System C Sharp. <laughs> hey, Joe, how are you doing, man? So uh, that is an interesting question, though, because, I mean, the GC often isn't a bottleneck in across the board just because it's there. Something's managing your memory, whether you're deleting yourself, right. whether you're using shared pointers, right. which of course is just reference counting, right. which has its own problems, mm -hmm. which is also a form of garbage mm -hmm. collection, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, it, uh, JB wants to know, is it required to have source code to go native? Um, can I throw bins into the pipeline? So the input to the .NET native tool chain is IL. And so we take the output of the C-sharp compiler, and that's actually what goes into our compiler. <coughs> uh, if you were to fire up Process Explorer when you did a .NET native build, you'll see CSC run, and then you'll see this tool called ILC run, the IL compiler. Uh, so if you have IL source code, or not IL source code, IL byte code, you should be able to put it through the .NET native compiler. Right on. So uh, let's see here. J Jin wants to know, is there a plan to make .NET native run on iOS, Android, so that .NET apps can run other platforms similar to Xamarin's mono.NET? I mean, let's be honest. Have the Xamarin guys already ported this stuff over to their world? I'm just playing. <laughs> I mean, uh, not that I'm aware of. That's his question. Yeah. Uh, 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 I would say to that statement that uh, Xamarin have their own um, ahead of uh, time uh, compiler. They have an AOT compiler as well, which mm -hmm. does uh, quite similar things to what the .NET Native does as well. So uh, what we're, uh, the goal here is, as far as .NET Native is concerned, for store applications, uh, we want to apply this technology to make store applications uh, faster. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the same time, the Xamarin and the Mono folks are doing uh, similar things for iOS and Android as well sure. to make their apps uh, faster as well. And so we're, we're developing this technology as we go along uh, right now, yeah. and, but there's no dependencies or, or code reuse between the, the two uh, teams. Understood. I mean, you're not jitting on iOS devices. I mean, you can't jit on an Android device, right? I mean, it's Java. <laughs> okay, so, there you go. <laughs> but you know, it's not really, they're not, Xamarin's not translating at the source code level. 
Yeah, yeah. Byte code optimizations and yeah, stuff like that. My understanding is, again, I think Miguel's the, the, the best person to answer this question, but they use a, a ahead of time uh, they are. compiler as Absolutely. well for both iOS as well as Android. Totally. To, to do a and he'll be the first one to go, we've been doing that for years, <laughs> right, man. Sure. Thanks for catching up. Yeah, okay. So, uh, will .NET support GPGPU like C++? So a lot of people have been asking about C++ AMP, mm -hmm. and really what they're asking about is C-sharp AMP. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but going back to his question, I mean, is there going to be support for general purpose programming on a GPU uh, in this world? So are you guys doing anything with making it easier for C-sharp people to target uh, a GPU? Uh, so right now, that is not currently on, on our roadmap, but one of the things that we are doing, Charles, is, uh, as I said, w the, w we're witnessing that people are doing all these amazing things with, with .NET, and if there uh, turns out to be a key requirement or set of customers that are really clamoring for it, I think we would consider it. I think CMD is a great example in my mind, right? I mean, I think it's, it has been outstanding for at least, I don't know, seven, eight year, yeah. years, and we've now finally decided that with the advances in processor instruction sets and so forth, and the ubiquity of that technology we bring to the market, so to speak. So there's, I don't think there's anything stopping us. It's just a matter of prioritization based on customer demand. That's, that's the only thing. Cool. Add destructors to C Sharp. Actually, you can. The Roslyn, go, go do that in the Roslyn go. source code. <laughs> go add destructors to C Sharp, man. There you go. So, Carlos, the C Sharp JIT compiler generates code for instruction level parallelism of modern processors. We sort of keep talking about the same general topic here. Yeah, so, so say the, the Ryu JIT compiler that, that we've got in CTP now, uh, it's, it's a much, they just spend a lot of time on the architecture to make it easier for them to add new optimizations in. So, uh, I don't think that's something they're working on currently, but if it, it's something that you know, the team will be looking at as, as we go forward. Excellent. Have the yeah. much greater ability to add optimizations like that in the future. Mm -hmm. Great questions, keep them up. Thank you, Niners. Uh, Carl wants to know, .NET Native Compiler did not support the x64 ARM XAML designer uh, for Windows 8.1 apps. Will you support WPF Windows form apps for .NET framework, blah, blah, blah? So that's an interesting question, right? So there's a lot of old .NET code out there that I'd love to drop into this modern world, have it nativized, and load faster. So that's sort of what he's asking. Uh, as I was mentioning previously, uh, we are, <laughs> Stock compilation is our first stop, so to speak, of but course. we are looking at additional scenarios such as, uh, you know, uh, desktop or other technologies. And uh, the thing I want to be clear about, Charles, is uh, the, the set of scenarios are immense, right? Trying to make the entire <laughs> .NET world uh, kind of highly compatible, and that's one of our key promises around .NET. On .NET Native is going to be a very, very big challenge for us. Sure. But we are looking at bringing in similar concepts and ideas as of .NET Native to our existing uh, set of scenarios. Uh, cool. I don't want to make any promises, but we are looking at it as we speak. Sure, and I mean, I think from the sort of, the people obviously, the programmers understand this, but maybe not the non-programmers, <laughs> but you know, .NET code, when it executes, is always native, right? Yes. That, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's yeah. not going to work. Right. So. You know, in some sense, the, like the, the naive way to look at it would be like, well, it's already native. Why can't I just take all of this stuff, regardless of scenario? It's going to be native anyway at runtime. What's the problem? So, so a lot of what we did here, which is interesting, as you, as you dig into the behind the scenes, I said we have this really small refactored CLR. The .NET 2 and 4, those CLRs, they're much bigger, you know, tens of megabytes. And it's because they provide a lot of services dynamically at runtime. One of the aims of the .NET native tool chain is, why are we doing all this stuff dynamically at runtime when well, we could just do it at build time? So uh, two examples are, are interrupt to native code and serialization. Mm. Uh, with interrupt to native code and the traditional CLR, you end up producing types and methods on the fly that we have to JIT, that your code, you, know, you just call the p-invoke and now all of a sudden in the background, tons and tons of things are happening that, that you, know, you didn't even know about and it's opaque to you. Sure. Uh, with .NET Native, we do that in the tool chain up front. We actually generate C-sharp code that gets also compiled by the C++ compiler, mm. uh, which means that we need fewer services from the runtime. Mm. What that also means is that the runtime doesn't provide yet all the same services as the full CLR. So uh, this is an early preview. There's, yeah. there's things coming up, but yeah, everything does run native, but there's you know, extra, there's extra tech that you need to throw of in course. to make it all work. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, it's going to be a tremendous engineering challenge. Yep. So again, how are these changes are going to affect legacy code? If the legacy code can run in this world, it should be fine, yes? Uh, but what do you mean by legacy code, I guess? I, I think that's a great question. So if by legacy code you mean an if you take an existing WPF application and uh, try and uh, 
run and, 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 and uh, build and run it with .NET Native? The, a the answer is currently no, because uh, we're going to have this tight integration with the IDE where you can essentially upload IL to the store, and, and .NET Native is actually a, a store compiler, per se, and then compiles that uh, in the store, and then you, you, the user brings down the native code. Uh, but uh, th I think that the, if I understand the, the question correctly, um, uh, you know, a lot of people want the benefits of .NET Native for the existing applications. And sure. uh, as I said, we're looking at the scenarios right now. But one thing I, I really want to underline, Charles, is the fact that <coughs> You know, uh, last count, .NET is now installed on, uh, I think, about 1.6 billion PCs, right? And so that is an incredible responsibility for us to make sure that uh, as we make changes in .NET, those changes are highly, highly compatible because even if you broke 1% of those uh, uh, machines, let's say, Charles, mm -hmm. that is millions and millions of customers. Sure. So we are very, very careful when we introduce a brand new technology such as .NET Native mm -hmm. that we want to keep our uh, customer promise of high compatibility and high quality and at the same time try and move into the future. So we're, we're um, you know, walking this very fine line of uh, keeping the existing scenarios, keep, keeping the existing apps working at the same time trying to move .NET into the future. And Excellent. you see us move further and further into the future but we also want to make sure things work well. Currently. Beautiful, and that's, that, and that's sort of the brilliant I, brilliance behind, let's start with an already sort of a subset of, of .NET, if you will, the Windows Store, yeah. the Windows Phone Store, and let's vet this out. Yeah, well, and, and the other thing I want to mention, Charles, is the fact that if you look at it, we're moving static compilation, dynamic compilation at the same time. So RioJIT is a great example where you can take your existing WPF and ASP.NET application and just run it on RioJIT to get uh, much better apps and startup as well as uh, uh, throughput uh, as well. And also take advantage of new optimizations like SIMD that right basically uh, can provide you up to 8x performance improvements over existing scenarios. Excellent. So Kevin has replied to ah, the okay. person who asked about how can I detect if RyoJIT is running. Yeah. He said his reply was vector math that is hardware accelerated is how you can figure that out. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> this is a first, man. We have this like, sort of meta kind of thing going on here. So uh, Joe wants to know, I'm surprised it's taken so long for this question, what kind of perf gains can we expect in general I mean, for a Windows Store app that's gone through not .NET. Uh, so what we've done, uh, in fact, what we do uh, today is this. We, we take um, all uh, C-sharp applications in the store today and we run them through the, 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 the tool, tool chain. And what we've seen is for the most popular applications uh, in this store, uh, we've seen up to 60% improvement. Uh, for some of them. If you take the typical application, and I showed this slide yesterday, Waterman, for example, mm -hmm. the cold startup has improved by about 39%. This is nice. without them doing a single thing, so to speak. And then we've seen also warm startup uh, improving by about 31%. Mm -hmm. And then uh, as far as memory usage is concerned, uh, they've seen a reduction of, of around 12, 13%. So nice. this is, the, the thing I love about this, Charles, is that this is, you know, without a developer lifting a finger other than essentially uh, re yeah, rebuild my app and Beautiful. then magic just happens, right? And then of course, in the future, which you've already discussed this, right. would be I upload my IL to the cloud, right. And then the cloud magically does what the cloud magically does. Right. Sends it down for ARM, sends it down for x64. Because .NET developers aren't used to targeting specific hardware. That's where the JIT came in. Right. But now they'll have to go, okay, I'm going to build this binary for ARM. Right? So yes. they're going to have to start getting into that mindset. And then test it on ARM, man. Yeah. Well, one point of clarification. So, uh, yes, they would need to uh, target specific architectures locally to be able to... to locally, yes. Uh, but when it goes up in the, into the cloud, the cloud will take care of generating code <laughs> for the different architectures. So we want to really, you know, we talk about the productivity of C Sharp, as Sean mentioned. We want to keep the same model where I don't have to think about those things when I upload my IL to the cloud. It just does magic for me, and then the user just gets the right binary for the right processor or architecture uh, magically. Excellent. So we're going to kind of do a little game of let's answer these questions really fast. Okay. So, uh, well, I'm not going to, sorry, that one's not going to really work out. Uh, Brent wants to know, can I send a project encode resulting file to the store today now? Uh, right now, we're developer preview, so we're not accepting apps into the store currently, but that's eventually we'll get there. Cool. I love how fast he talks. It's perfect. <laughs> so Felix wants to know, will .NET Native replace Triton for phone? Will it support Triton-like late binding mode? Where the binding mode, we do have a, we go in the IL to native code, we do use a binder. Right now it's on device. We're 
we may put it in the cloud, we may not. Uh, or sorry, right now it's in the cloud. We may put it on device, we may not. Right on. Yeah. So Android wants to know, are there limitations in terms of debugging production code in .NET Native? E.g., you need to use WinDebug instead of VS. You do not. You, need to, you can use VS. Uh, it's C++ optimized code, though, so, you know. Should we really expect the same level of performance to see in C++? Yes. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Really? yes. All right. <laughs> Carlos, finally, hey. Thank you for the great questions. I wish we had more time, but unfortunately, you have to watch the next great session from Build.